Okay, everybody, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Zoom. See if we can get this started. There we go. All right. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about utility billing for manufactured home parks and floating home marinas. Um, again, my name is Samantha Sheehan. I am an attorney with the Oregon Law Center, and I um, represent solely tenants who live in these manufactured home parks and floating home marinas. Um, my position is funded through a special assessment um, that is paid for by you guys, so by facility tenants. Uh, you pay $10 a year, and that's what goes into this big pot, and that funds, um, funds these services for you guys. Again, this applies only to facility tenants. That means that you own your manufactured home or your floating home and you live in a park or marina, which is essentially um, four spaces for rent um, that are pretty close together. There's specific spacing requirements, but that's pretty much what you need to know. If you're living in, in a park with a landlord, you rent your space, you own your home, um, and you've got at least four neighbors, then you're probably in a park. Um, a caveat, this is not legal advice. I cannot provide anyone here with legal advice. Um, that means that what I'm doing right now is giving you legal information. So we're going to go over the statutes, the requirements, some of the impacts. Um, but I cannot apply the law that we're going to discuss today to the facts of your specific legal issue. Um, so if you do need legal advice, I highly suggest that you reach out to your local legal aid office. Each county in Oregon is covered by a legal aid office. Um, legal aid offices do provide free legal services. Um, however, you do have to qualify both financially and um, based on the, the issue that you have. Um, right now, I am at capacity, so I am not taking new cases, most likely through the end of the year, um, but you can always reach out to me, you can reach out to MMCRC, and um, we will do our best to get those get those referrals out to people who've got the capacity to, to take it on. Oh, duplicate slide. <laughs> All right. So the, there's a few different ways that your landlord is allowed to bill you for utilities in parks. So the first and the most simple is through direct billing, which just means that you contract with the service provider directly, um, and then the service provider provides you with that utility, and they provide you with the bill, and then you pay that bill to the utility provider. Your landlord is not involved in the provision of that utility and is not involved, involved in the billing for that utility. Um, this is definitely the most straightforward billing method um, and the one that you know we see the least amount of problems with because it's not in your landlord's hands, right? <laughs> Excuse me. So the second way um, is called rent included bill billing. Um, this used to be very common in Oregon, but has since become less common because water, as we know, has become more expensive. Um, so where it used to be affordable for a landlord to provide the park with water and just, um, you know, have a slightly higher rent amount so that they could cover that cost for the park, um, that's really become untenable for landlords. Um, so so this, we don't see this quite as often as we used to, um, but essentially rent included billing, right, is that the service or utility provider provides that utility to the whole park. So you've got water, electric, all of those things in your home, um, and but the landlord is billed for the entire park from the utility provider. And rather than the landlord providing you with a bill um, so that you know, you're paying back what the, the service provider charged to your landlord, your landlord just bakes that cost into your rent amount. Um, your rent remains the same every single month, right? So they can't say, okay, well, your utilities were more expensive in February than they were in January, so your rent is going to be higher in February. That's not allowed, right? It has to be a fixed rent amount, um, and the rent increase laws do apply. So your landlord can still only increase your rent once a year and only up to that statutory maximum amount. Um, the Some of the more common billing methods that we see in parks, um, pro rata billing, 
So this is where the service provider provides the utility to the entire park and to each tenant's space. And the landlord is the one who is billed for the entire usage of the park. However, rather than under rent included billing where they're baking that cost into your rent, the landlord is actually going to take that full cost of providing the, the utilities to the park and split it up among tenants in a way that is fair. Um, what we call this is pass-through billing. It means that you're the one that's receiving the utility, but the landlord is the one that is being billed for it. So the landlord is passing through that bill from the utility provider to the tenant. And again, pro rata billing just means that they're splitting up the entire amount of the utility cost um, in a specific way. So there are different ways that you can split things up under pro rata. Um, probably the most common is by each rented space. So if you have 100 spaces in your park, you receive a utility bill or the landlord receives a utility bill for $100 um, and the pro rata share for each individual space would be $1, right? Obviously, that's a very low amount and not, not what you're going to see, but I'm terrible at math, so that was for me. <laughs> All right, and then the last uh, the last legal billing method and probably um, maybe the most common, something that we're definitely seeing landlords um, uh, favor and trying to switch over to submeter billing. Um, and that is submeter billing, as I mentioned. So this is where the service provider um, provides that utility to, to the entire park. Um, and the bill is provided to the landlord for the entire park the utility provider is going to measure the usage based on a master meter for the entire park. The landlord will have submeters installed on each individual space, and those submeters will measure the usage for each space, right? So under submeter billing, you're going to be charged for your usage. Um, your landlord is still going to be charging you for that usage, right? Because the landlord is paying for the entire park's usage, then they'll bill you for your usage. And that's how they'll be able to recoup the amount charged by the service provider. Um, now, it's important to note that under both pro rata billing and under submeter billing, your landlord can include other charges. And we'll talk a little bit about what those are. But it's you know, your bill may include more charges other than just your usage under submeter billing or just your share of that specific utility under pro rata. Like I said, there are requirements for including those additional charges, and we'll talk a little bit about those as we go on. <clears throat> so some general principles that are really important to remember as you go through these statutes and discuss the law. Um, First is that a utility or service charge is not rent or a fee. That means that your landlord cannot issue you a notice of termination for non-payment of rent, but they can issue you a notice of termination for cause for failing to pay this fee, or for, excuse me, for failing to pay this charge, right? So, um, Terminations for non-payment of rent operate under different rules than terminations for cause. And part of those differences is that the uh, termination for non-payment of rent has a shorter timeline. So the fact that these do not fall under rent is, is really important to note because um, the consequence of that is that you are receiving actually more protections under the law um, for failing to pay this, right? So the notice of termination for cause is a 30-day notice and has to include an opportunity to cure. So if the issue is, right, that you didn't pay a utility or service charge, then what your landlord has to do is issue you a notice of termination. It would say 30-day notice for cause. It will explain, you know, in, you know, in uh, November, Samantha Sheehan did not pay her utility charge of eighty six ninety seven. dollars um, This is your notice that if you do not pay this within the next 30 days, then your rental agreement will terminate and we have the right to file an eviction against you in court. That means that you then have those next 30 days right until that termination date to pay that utility bill, to pay that cost. 
And then if you do that within those 30 days, you're going to avoid termination. And so that means that your landlord then cannot file an eviction against you based on that notice of termination. Um, it is imp important to note, though, that um, those notices for cause, um, there is a con there is a term in the law that allows your landlord to issue a repeat notice for cause. Um, so if this happens, say this happened in November, your landlord gave you the notice later in November and say it's going to expire on December 15th of this year, right? That means that in from January, February, March, April, May, you need to make sure that you're paying your utility bill on time because if you don't, your landlord does have the right to issue a repeat notice for cause um, and that does not include an opportunity to cure. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but I do just want to note that um, the, the legislature did pass a new law that does include protections um, for terminations for non-payment, not just terminations for non-payment of rent, but terminations for non-payment of any kind. That includes those terminations for non-payment under the 30-day notice, um, and that includes Part of that law gives you the opportunity to pay off that amount that you owe all the way up until your trial. Um, so it has to be before trial, right? You can't go to trial and then pretty much lose and then say, oh, here you go, landlord, right? You have to do it before you before the trial starts. Um, but but this is a brand new law. You you used to not have the opportunity to what we call cure or um, you know fix the eviction once that once the cure date ran out, right? So once your notice was over you're kind of out of luck, right? To, you can't cure it by, you can't avoid eviction by just paying the amount. Um, the law changed. It now does allow you to avoid eviction by paying the amount. So even if you do get that repeat notice, there, um, there you know, may be an opportunity for you to pay the amount and avoid eviction in that case. Um, however, I would like to say it's always better to avoid getting these notices in the first place. And so knowing that failure to pay your, um, your utility bill may result in getting a notice. And so it's just something that you wanna take, take seriously and um, make sure that you're paying that on time. <clears throat> so a written bill is required where, unlike rent, where rent is always due on the date that it said it's due in your rental agreement uh, without the landlord ever needing to demand that payment, right? Once you move in, once you sign a rental agreement, that rent is automatically due, whether your landlord tells you that it's due, provides you with a written bill or not, right? So that's always going to be due. Unlike rent, utilities are only due, only, your landlord can only require you to pay these utility charges if they provide you with a written bill. Um, that written bill has to state the utility or service charge, uh, like what it is, the amount of it, and the due date for the payment. These bills will often say that the Due date is the day that you receive the payment. Um, I believe that the law is written in that way um, to kind of reflect regular utility billing practices. Um, if you had direct billing and you received a bill from your utility provider like PUD or eWeb or sub, right, they're going to say this is due upon receipt. So once you get it and you open it, you're supposed to pay it. But you do have that um, but there's a grace period before it's considered late, right? And so because your landlord, in order to require you to pay this, would have to provide you with a 30-day notice, even though your bill says it's due that day, um, you know, your landlord can't evict you for, or can't, can't do anything other than provide you with that notice of termination for failure to pay after that due date. And then again, like I said, you'll have those 30 days to be able to pay that. Um, so it's a little bit strange, but that's just how the, that's, that's what the law says. Um, so, and these bills do require your charges to be itemized, right? So if you are paying submeter billing, say for water on your space, then there will need to be an entry for your, your, your water bill, right? So it'll have to say water, reflect the usage and the amount that you are paying that month for water. If you are say billed, pro rata for garbage, you need to have another section, another line on that bill that says garbage in the amount that you are due to pay for it. 
if your rental agreement requires that uh, tenants pay a share of the common area utilities, again, that's going to have to be a separately itemized charge on that bill. So it would say common area utilities and the amount. Um, this, the reason why this requirement exists is because under pro rata billing, right, they're taking the entire usage of the park and splitting that up um, among tenants. And so the, I think the fear was, right, that some of these additional charges might be added into that initial pot and then split up among tenants. And it, while tenants do have the opportunity to inspect the utility bills to make sure that they're being paid correct or being charged correctly, um, it can be difficult to figure out exactly, um, you know, exactly what everyone's amount is, right? Because under pro rata billing, you don't necessarily have to bill by space. You could bill, say, by occupants in each home. And if you don't know exactly how many occupants are in each and every home, doing that kind of math to determine whether your landlord is charging each person the right amount is going to be difficult, right? Because in order to do that math, you need to know how many people or how many occupants are living in the park that count towards that, that equation, right? Um, so, so this is part of the reason why your landlords have to itemize things um, to make it really clear for you and to, to allow you guys to really be able to check to make sure that things are being charged correctly. Um, even though that's difficult practically, um, you know, that's why the, the law is there for that. Um, again, if you're, if, if you receive a bill every month, I think this is pretty common in part because I see this often where you get an invoice every month that will say, you know, will list your space rent for the following month, list your utility charges for the previous month. Um, it might list, you know, a special assessment or something else that you might have to pay, um, for like the installation of submeters or something. If that is all together on that same list as rent, it needs to be really clear that rent is separate than your utilities. And again, failure, so non-payment of rent is in this category over here. This law, um, don't, you know, governs non-payment of rent. This law over here governs non-payment of a utility or service charge. So if you pay so if your invoice total is say $1,000, but only $750 of that is your rent and the other 250 are you know, utility or service charges, a, a parking spot, a storage fee, whatever it is, right? Your landlord can only demand that you pay that $750 through the non-payment of rent statute, right? So they can't it, they can't reject your, your rent check if you send a rent check for $750, which is your space rent. Even though your total invoice says $1,000, they have to accept your rent. They can't demand that your charges and fees be paid at the same time as your rent, right? Rent is, is due in a different way. Different laws apply. Um, and I have seen landlords attempt to do this. Most of the time, landlords are pretty receptive um, when you say no <laughs> to them, um, because it's pretty pretty clear in the law that um, that these are separate things, that there's a separate mechanism for collecting uh, the utility or service charges. And um, while you can dem demand full payment of rent at one time, you can't demand full payment of rent plus these other charges or fees. Um, they're just, they are separate payments, right? Um, inspection of utility bills. So this is really the linchpin for the tenant's ability to double check the landlord is doing things correctly. So if your landlord is using pro rata or sub meter billing, meaning they're receiving the master bill and then they're splitting that master bill up among tenants, either based on your meter reading, so your usage, or based on some kind of a, a fair split up equation that they've determined and that's in your rental agreement, um, then they have to, number one, post the utility bill each month or each utility cycle, right? So sometimes utilities are charged quarterly, not monthly, right? So the 
the requirement is not based on months. It's based on um, the the billing period from the utility provider. But for most utilities, that is monthly. Um, so they have to post those bills in a common area that includes an online location. So it could be put up in a portal or on a website. Um, that is okay. It can also be posted in you know, the manager's office or near the mailboxes. Um, it can really be posted. The, the Where it's posted is pretty flexible. It's just that that needs to be available for tenants. Uh, tenants also have the right to inspect, the, excuse me, the past 12 months. And that actually is a 12 month requirement. So you're allowed to look at the past years, uh, the past one year of utility bills but you do have to provide written requests to your landlord before they will before this will happen, right? You can't just walk into the manager's office and say, "Hey, manager, I'd like to see all twelve months of these this utility bill, right?" That you have to give them some notice, um, and then your landlord will essentially create, you know, you you and your landlord will have to talk about a time and a date and a location to meet to go over the bills. Um, they're not required to give you. 12 months of this bill, right? They're not required to give you copies of these bills. What they're required to do is let you inspect them. Um, you know, I would argue that you could take pictures of them, particularly the thing that uh, the bills that have been posted in a common area. I think there's there's no legal issue with taking photos of those. Um, if you're in the manager's private office and you're looking at all of those 12 months of utility bills, I would, um, ask for permission before you start taking pictures in that situation, just to be sure that you're not causing any additional animosity that might be going on. Um, and if you're in a private location that is under the control of the manager, you may actually legally need their permission. But so the inspection of the utility bills, as I mentioned earlier, this is the way that you're going to be able to check that your landlord is dividing up those costs um, according to your rental agreement. Um, and so, you know, again, the way that you would do that, if you're under pro rata billing, you'd have to understand what the method for apportioning, what the method for splitting, splitting things up is. If it's by occupied space, then, you know, you need to count up the spaces that are occupied by tenants. And then you would divide the full bill amount, which is the, the amount that would be posted uh, by the landlord or that you were able to inspect, right? It's those the provider's utility bill. Um, so you take that amount and you would divide it up by the amount of occupied spaces. And then that should give you the amount that each tenant is charged for that utility. If that amount is different, then that's... Um, Kind of a red flag, right? A red flag to this is the time that I should probably pick up the phone and give somebody a call. Let's call legal aid. Let's call MMCRC. Let's see what's going on here because, um, you know, my landlord's supposed to be splitting up my rent based on the occupied homes, and I got charged a hundred dollars. And when I did the math, it should have been fifty. So that's a pretty big discrepancy, right? And so um, that's really one of those times where you're going to want to, you know, get those ears up and be like, I, I better go talk to somebody. Um, now, if if you do the math and th it's off by a couple dollars, that actually just might mean that um, the the pro rata or the occupied spaces were counted maybe before someone else moved in or before someone moved out, right? And so that that number is maybe off by one or two occupied spaces. There is an exception in the law that if the landlord bills a little bit bills incorrectly, but it's because of a an honest mistake in counting those those spaces, that's really not going to count. So it's it's really those bigger discrepancies that we're looking at, that those are really the things that you're going to want to talk to probably an attorney about. Um, but those smaller ones, again, there's likely going to be some sort of an exception that allows the landlord to get kind of get out of that situation, right? Um, if that's the case, it could be something where you simply alert your landlord hey, I'm noticing that this is the amount of occupied spaces. My bill should have been this. And they might actually be willing to just go ahead and change the pro rata um, equation to reflect the actual numbers in the park, right? So some of that is literally just the, the, you know, the flexibility that occurs because people are moving in and moving out at different times while they're living in the park. 
So pro rata billing, we've talked about this a bit already. Um, so the amount that the landlord can apportion under pro rata billing must be the amount that's actually charged to the landlord by the service provider. So, you know, if the landlord, if the service provider provides a $5 handling fee for sending hard copy bills, that's not something that they can pass through to the tenants, right? That's what we would call a handling or an administrative cost. Um, if your landlord fails to pay their bill on time and has a late fee, that is a, an administrative charge. That's not something that they can pass through to tenants, right? So it is supposed to be the amount charged for using the service, right? And not all services are charged by usage. You know, you can think about, um, say, internet, right? Or, or cable, you know, those are not charged by usage. You charge, you're charged a flat fee and then you can use as much or as little of it as you want in the month, right? So um, we're not always talking about usage, but we are always talking about the amount that's actually billed to the landlord aside from any of those you know, administrative costs, uh, late fee charges, things like that, that those would be the, the landlord's responsibility and they cannot pass those through onto the tenant. Um, the apportionment method, so the way that we're splitting this up in between tenants, um, that's, a, that's flexible. The law doesn't say you must do this or this or this. Um, it does include some examples, but you'll notice the language there that says, but is not limited to, um, and that's really important. That means that there's flexibility, right? So long as the method reasonably allocates the cost among the affected tenants, right? So that means that as long as each tenant that is using that service and being billed for that service is being charged a reasonable amount, like a reasonable share of the full cost, right? Um, the, the statute does lay out a few different options. And these are, I think the first two are the ones that we see most often. I've never seen the third one take place. It, it seems like a lot of math, which is maybe why we don't see it very often, who knows? Um, but so, so some of the most common ways to allocate the cost or split up the cost between the tenants is, um, as I mentioned before, the number of occupied spaces in the facility. So, you know, if you've got a park of 100 spaces and three of those spaces or, you know, say five of those spaces are not occupied right now, then you would be, you know, your landlord would be taking the, the full amount of that bill and splitting that bill, dividing it by 95, right? Because even though there's 100 spaces in your park, only 95 of them are owner occupied right now, right, are being rented by someone who owns their home. Um, and so that that would be the number that you're dividing that that total bill from. Um, also, <clears throat> the number of tenants or occupants in the dwelling. So I've seen this occur quite a few times. This uh, happens often when uh, this is actually something that tenants will request often because um, under the number of occupied spaces in the facility, your usage is not taken into consideration, right? Your usage if you use less electricity or less water than everyone else, you may be affecting that that pot, the big pot by a little bit, but the amount, it's not affecting your share of the amount, right? Every single person in the park is going to pay the same share under the number of occupied spaces in the facility method. So if your neighbor waters their lawn every morning and every night and is out there watering their flowers every afternoon and, you know, has three teenagers who take three showers a day, right? They're using clearly way more water than a, a one individual who, who doesn't water their lawn and doesn't have a garden and you know maybe doesn't even have a dishwasher, right? And so that person is paying the same for water as the person with three kids who's watering their lawn all day. And so often tenants find that to be unfair and they would prefer to do something that's more based on usage. And so the number of tenants um, or occupants in each home kind of correlates to that usage, right? If you have five people in your home versus one person, the five person home is, 
I would say 99.9% .9 of the time going to be using more water than the one person home, right? And so it's a way to try and split up uh, split up the cost among the tenants that's a little bit more fair and reflects a little bit more accurately the usage of each of those, those dwellings. Um, the last method that the, the law lays out, but again, other methods are allowed, is going by the square footage of each dwelling. So basically you would take the square footage of all the occupied dwellings in the park and then your square footage so you have your total total amount and then you basically divide it by the cost so you figure out how much each square footage would have to pay and then if your house is say 500 square feet and the amount per square foot is one dollar then you'd be paying five hundred dollars right so um again these are not accurate numbers. I just am bad at math. So I need to do things that are simple. Um, but, but so this is, again, this is just, it's confusing. I calculating the amount of square footage for each dwelling and for the whole park takes time and administrative costs. And um, I've never seen a landlord do this before. And that's probably why, because it's, um, you know, and at the end of the day, it's not that accurate anyways right because a lot of water usage occurs outside um watering lawns watering washing cars that kinds of thing um and we're not even counting the rented space here or the lawn or any of that it's just the actual space of your dwelling um again like we mentioned on the last slide pro rata billing does require that your landlord provide you with that written bill um and the you know those utility charges must be itemized on your bill. So if you're being charged for water, for electricity, for common areas, um, for garbage, all of that will need to be itemized separately on that bill that they provide to you. Um, you also have the op wrong page. You also have the opportunity to inspect your utility bills. Um, we talked about this on the last slide as well, but this is really the key to you being able to determine whether or not your landlord is following the law and apportioning the amount correctly. Um, landlords have to post those bills in common areas or online um, for each billing cycle. And upon written request, you can inspect the past 12 months. But again, your landlord is not required to let you take those documents with you. With you. Um, they're required to allow you to inspect them. So look at them and they can do that either in their office or they can set up a time to meet you at a coffee shop, right? So it just, um, the law requires that they set up a time and date and location to meet with you for you to inspect those bills. They, it, the law does not require that they provide you copies of those bills. <clears throat> so submeter billing, this is really the, I you know, the law is kind of pushing towards submeter billing. Um, as I mentioned prior, Water is a lot more expensive than it used to be. And um, we've seen, you know, it's just empirical data shows that um, people are less likely to, or people are more likely to conserve water when they are billed for water based on their usage. And so that's why submeter billing does kind of have a, a preference under the law. And we'll talk about, I'll talk a little bit about the impacts um, that that preference for submeter billing has on tenants because there are some some pretty significant impacts for tenants because the legislature is you know prefers the submeter billing and wants to incentivize landlords to move to the sub submeter billing. Um, so under submeter billing, tenants are billed for their usage. There is a submeter on your space. Um, the utility is provided again to the landlord, and that utility is calculated by a master meter. And then, um, you know, when it's provided to the landlord, it's provided directly to each space, but the landlord is the one that's per, you know, receiving the bill. Then the landlord uses those individual meters to read your, your individual usage on your space, and then they will charge you for that usage. Now, the rate that your landlord is allowed to charge you cannot be higher than the average rate for utility usage billed by the service provider over the last year. Um, again, this does not include those base or service charges or administrative costs. Um, 
this is you know what you'll be billed or water you'll be billed for that usage if there are other costs associated here that they need to be itemized on your bill um so I, like I mentioned, the landlord is allowed to charge additional costs um, for utility or service costs when they use submeter billing, particularly for water. Um, so, so your landlord can include um, a pro rata share of the storm or wastewater cost that the landlord or that the service provider charges the landlord. Um, but that's only if that amount charged by the service provider is based on the total usage of water provided, right? So that's to say if, if the utility provider says, okay, we provided 100 gallons of water, that means that there's 100 gallons of wastewater, right? And so if those numbers, if the usage and the number and the amount they're charging you for wastewater are related, so if you use more, you're getting charged more for wastewater, then your landlord is allowed um, to to split that cost up in a pro rata way, right? So as long as it fairly splits up the cost between all the tenants, um, they're allowed to do that and include that on your utility bill. Um, any public service charges are allowed to be on your utility bill, and that's true across the board. But again, those have to be stated separately. Um, public service charges are generally like sort of a tax, right, from the county. Um, it's something that you would be charged by, generally by the city or the, the county. Um, and and yeah, 90.570 does talk a little bit more about that. I'm not gonna talk about it because it's, it's pretty obvious when these things come through. Um, again, your landlord can charge you a pro rata share of your common area utilities, but only if that is in your rental agreement. Um, or under one specific circumstance. Any base or service charge billed to the service provider, they may, they are allowed to recoup that cost, but again, it can't be in that usage amount. It can't be in your water amount, right? They're not allowed to split that up in that way. They have to separately itemize it, explain this is the base or service charge charged by eWeb, and then your, your pro rata share. Um, now we're getting into a little bit of these impacts on tenants um, for this preference for submeter billing. If your landlord uses a third party service provider, so the most common one that I've seen is called submeter solutions. If your landlord is using a company like submeter solutions who read the water bills and are the ones that issue the tenants the bill um, and collect the money from the tenant, right? That they, this third party does all of those things that the landlord would normally be responsible for doing. Then the landlord is allowed to charge tenants a pro rata share of the cost for employing that third party. Again, it has to be on your bill. And it's not that that cost is like the monthly cost to hire that company to provide the service of reading meters and billing tenants. It can't include additional things like maintenance that was done during that month or repair costs that were needed during that month, right? Um, it has to just be for the service of reading the meters and billing the tenants. This third party also must allow tenants to inspect their billing, their billing records. So that same um, inspection requirement applies to this third party. Um, un unfortunately, the third party does not have to post their utility bills, but if you request a utility bill from the third party, they are required to allow you to review those utility bills. Um, and I'll say I actually very recently um, worked with Submeter Solutions. We believe there might have been an overpayment and they were lovely to work with. They provided all of the um, all of the readings and documents um, and were, were super helpful. So um, so I can attest that this the third party, the main third party that's doing this in Oregon um, is following this and is allowing people to inspect their bills. Um, of course, I'm an attorney, not a tenant, and I often get different reactions from, from landlords or from companies that landlords work with than, uh, than tenants do. So um, if you attempt to get your records from Submeter Solutions and you know, you're facing a bunch of 
or not just submeter solutions, but any third party, and you face a bunch of um, pushback, you know, again, that's something where you might want to reach out to an attorney um, and, uh, you know, cite a law in your letter to them. Um, but but generally, my my experience has been relatively pleasant with, with these companies. Um, and unfortunately, the landlord does not have a duty to... Oh, the landlord does not have a duty to inspect the meters for accuracy. So when a landlord installs submeters on the space, there's a three month trial period at that time that it converts to submeter billing. During that period, the landlord is providing the tenant with mock-up bills that actually reflect the usage and what they would be charged under submeter billing but the tenant is not actually paying those bills. They're just being able to see, okay, this is what my, my monthly usage looks like. This is what these additional charges are. So this is what I would be needing to pay every month for utilities and services. Um, so during those three months, if the tenant is noticing that there are, um, that you know their usage is way higher than they expected it to be or that things look off, that's really the time that you need to be reporting the, that to the landlord. Um, the landlord does have a duty to make sure that those meters are working accurately during that three month trial period. But after that three month trial period, they no longer have the duty to test the meters for accuracy. Um, that does not mean that they don't have a duty to maintain the submeters, they do. So if you notice that your submeter is no longer working or you believe that it's um, over reading or under reading, although I don't know why you would tell your landlord about an under reading meter, um, but if it's over reading, right, um, you can tell your landlord that, make a written repair request, and they are required to maintain those submeters. So if your submeter is broken, they do have to maintain it. They just don't have to do regular tests to make sure that it is working properly. So something that I get asked a lot is, can my landlord change the utility billing method without my consent or agreement? So generally speaking, under landlord tenant law, um, landlords cannot unilaterally amend a rental agreement. Um, however, the law does allow your landlord to unilaterally change the method of your utility billing in a few ways. Now, again, remember we talked about how the legislature has a preference towards billing for usage and that, you know, generally speaking, there is a preference for um, water conservation. And we believe that water conservation is best accomplished through billing people for their usage of water rather than a flat fee. Um, so you'll see so that's kind of why the landlord or why the legislature allows the landlord to again unilaterally change so change without your consent without your agreement you don't have to sign anything you don't have to like it your landlord can just do it um they can change your utility billing method for water and wastewater billing only if your existing method is rent included billing can they change it to pro rata right or they can change it to submeter if it's rent included. If the existing method is already pro rata billing, then your landlord can use these statutes to change to submeter billing. Your landlord cannot use these statutes to change from submeter billing to rent included billing. Can't do it. You have to start off either at rent included billing or pro rata billing for your landlord to be able to use these statutes to convert your water billing method. And again, like I mentioned, the point of all of this, right, is to encourage water conservation. And so it doesn't make, it makes no sense to allow your landlord to change from a method that would, you know, help conserve water to a method that does not help and help preserve water, water, right? So if you kind of have that in your mind when you're thinking about these statutes, they tend to make a little bit more sense about why, why there are these restrictions in place. Um, your landlord may also unilaterally change your water service billing method. Um, if your existing method is rent included billing um, or pro rata billing, your landlord may change to direct billing. There are um, 
limitations and requirements. Um, so if your landlord wants to use one of these statutes to change your utility billing method without your consent, um, then they're gonna have to follow the, the process. Sorry, oh, some issues, there we go. Um, so the process and legal requirements for converting um, your water billing method differ based on whether you're starting off with rent included billing or you're starting off with pro rata billing. Um, we're not gonna go over all of the differences or all of the scenarios because it's honestly just a little bit confusing. And um, I think that the better, more helpful thing to do is to make sure that you know some of the, the basic requirements that apply to any of these situations. Um, and then we'll go over some of the, the main differences between conversion from rent included um, to conversion from pro rata. Um, and I'll also just note that, like I mentioned, the law sets forth the different requirements for the different conversion methods. Um, and that can be confusing and landlords are not exempt from confusion. So, you know, part of the reason why I'm not going to go over all of this in super, super detail as well is because um, oftentimes your landlords aren't using the right statute either. Right. And so really what you need to do as a tenant is be able to identify that your landlord is attempting to convert your water billing method and then um ensure that your landlord is doing some of these basic things that apply to all situations. And if you see in those situations, if you see that landlord's not doing some of those basic things, I think that's a good time to give your, give a, give legal aid a call um, and, and see if you can't get someone, someone to, to help look at the situation, because like I mentioned, they're complicated. They're complicated for anyone, including me who, only ever looks at the this part of the law, right? And so, um, yeah, it, it's it, it's not super easy to to get right. And so, um, so really, what you want to do is just in your mind say, landlord is attempting to bill for water. This is my existing billing method. This is what they're trying to do to change it. And did they do the rest of the stuff on this slide? Right? Did they hold that meeting? Did they deliver the notice? Um, and if those things are not being met, that's again, you know, call your le local legal aid office because it seem if if they're not doing what's on this slide right here, um, then they've done something wrong. So, um, all right. So <clears throat> again, these always apply to the unilateral water billing changes. So at least one month prior to conversion, the landlord has to deliver a written notice that describes that they want to change the water billing method, what that new method is, the reason for changing the method, and the process and schedule for the change. This notice also must include the date, time, and location of the meeting that we're going to talk about in number three. Um, at the same time they deliver that notice, they are to deliver um, an OHCS handout on utility billing, not unity billing. That's a typo. Um, and, <clears throat> and that's a, a pretty extensive document that explains, you know, what we're discussing here in, in great detail um, and may or may not be um be useful to your own understanding, right? Like I mentioned, it is very extensive. And so um, if if you get it, you read it and you're confused um, and you don't believe that your landlord is holding the meeting or delivered the notice correctly, again, that's a time where you can reach out to your local legal aid office um, and discuss that conversion and see if your landlord's doing it correctly. Um, as I mentioned, so the, the written notice must include the date, time and location of this meeting. Um, so landlord is also required to hold a meeting with tenants at least one, one month prior to the conversion. Um, at that meeting, the landlord needs to explain the change in billing method, um, answer questions regarding the utility and service billing, and distribute a sample utility and service charge statement. So distribute a sample bill. Um, and that bill has to include an explanation of each entry on the charge or, for the charge or the statement, right? So 
basically what it would say is, you know, uh, water, and this is the estimated time, right? And then there would be an explanation to say, this is your charge for your water usage, usage is measured by your submeter, right? Like there would be a small explanation of what, what that charge is. Um, if they are now charging you for common areas, right, then it would say common area water and put that pro rata amount. And then the explanation would need to say, you know, pro rata um, amount for common area utilities. So it has to explain each charge on there. Um, and during that meeting, you should be able to look at that bill and ask questions about that bill, ask questions about the charges. Oh, I keep going backwards. There we go. <laughs> All right. Um, so like I mentioned, actually, let me go back for a second. So this is what has to happen every single time. Anytime your landlord is attempting to change your water billing method um, without your approval or your consent, they must do this stuff here. Um, the next slide applies only when we're converting from rent included building to pro rata billing. Um, like I mentioned, the different types of billing conversions have different requirements. So we're gonna talk about these because this is one of the main, main differences. If you're converting from rent included billing to pro rata billing, your landlord actually does have a, a, a duty to conduct testing of the utility or service line. As we talked about before, your landlord does not have a duty to test your submeters, right? But that's under submeter billing. So here we're talking about pro rata billing, meaning the landlord receives one bill from the, the service provider and then splits that bill up among tenants based on the amount of occupied spaces, the amount of occupants in each dwelling, right? Depending on their pro rata method. Under that, uh, under pro rata, they have to conduct testing of the utility or service lines, the water utility or service lines at the time they convert to pro rata billing, as well as every three years following that conversion. They have to make those testing results available to tenants. Um, and they this testing is not required inside of the home, right? Because the home is owned by the tenant. You don't have to, they don't have to do it inside the home. There's no duty for the landlord to do these tests inside the home. Um, landlord also has to fix any leaks that they find through that testing within a reasonable time. Um, again, those leaks would have to be fixed in any common areas, in any, um, you know, up to your rented space, up to the connection to your home, right? But, but not within your home. If there's a leak inside your home, that is your responsibility. The other very unique thing about conversion from rent included, and this again, only includes rent included billing. So only when you start at rent included billing will this apply, that your landlord is required to reduce your rent. So if they're switching from rent included to pro rata, you used to pay 575 a month for rent and that included all of your utilities, but now you're going to be paying a portion of the, the park's utilities, right? In addition to your, your space rent, well, that's kind of a, a windfall for landlord if they get to collect the same amount of rent and they get to collect those utilities on top of that, right? And so the way that we are, um, the way that the law kind of protects tenants from that windfall is that it requires the landlord to reduce the tenant's rent on a pro rata basis, um, meaning that your landlord essentially has to look at over the past year, how much money were they you know, how much, what portion of your rent amount was going towards utilities every month, right? And so if you paid $575 and your landlord was generally using $50 of that money to, to pay the utility bill, then they should be reducing your rent by $50, right? The way that you can find that out is that you look at the utility bills provided to the landlord, and then you divide that, you know, by the amount of tenants in the park or not, excuse me, by the amount of occupied spaces in the park. Um, and then that will give you the amount that, you know, the amount of rent or the amount from each space every 
for those utilities that needed to be paid in order to pay the whole bill, right? So um, I feel like I explained that confusingly and if there's questions, I'm happy to answer those. <laughs> um, but so landlords are allowed to get out of this because you know the law loves to provide us with exceptions and, and those fun little loopholes. Um, basically, if the landlord, um, you know, the landlord has a right to raise your rent every single year, right? And so if the amount of money that they were paying towards utilities every month from your rent was about $50, and so they would have to reduce your rent by $50 every month, but they were allowed to do a rent increase in a couple months or that year, right? What they could do is say, rather than reducing your rent by $50 a month, um, when we when we raise our rent next, we will raise it by fifty dollars less than we were allowed to. So if they were allowed to raise your rent, say seventy five dollars, um, they can avoid reducing your rent under when they convert from rent included to pro rata. If they basically agree and don't raise your rent that full seventy five, they can only then raise it that twenty five, right? Because the you basically are already paying that rent increase by paying that $50 um, because that $50 used to pay for your utilities. And now you're paying for utilities separately and that $50. So that's kind of the way that your landlord can get out of it is by reducing, um, a, you know, lowering a future rent increase by that required amount rather than reducing your rent, you know, reducing your rent in December and then raising your rent back you know back in 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 January right so they raise reduce it by $50 in December and then you know you get a rent increase notice that's increasing your rent by that 75 it's just it doesn't really make a lot of sense you're going down you're going up and so that's that's why they let landlords do that um when the landlord is calculating this amount that they need to reduce your rent um they must provide written documentation that is from the actual service provider that shows their costs over the past year. So generally that's going to be the bills that they've received, right? And again, tenants already have the right to inspect these bills because um, or under pro rata billing, tenants would have the right to inspect these bills moving forward. But under rent included billing, there's not really that um, that requirement. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about conversion to submeter billing. So we were just talking about the specific situation of converting from rent included to sub or to pro rata billing, which so that was our previous subject, our current subject right now is talking about converting to submeter billing. The first first subject here applies to any time a landlord uh, converts to submeter billing. It doesn't matter if you've converted from pro rata billing. It doesn't matter if you've converted from rent including. Um, this is going to apply. So after the installation of the submeters, but before you receive your first bill based on that submeter billing, the landlord must conduct a three month trial period. So we talked a little bit about this before, but essentially that um, during that trial period, your landlord has to provide you or provide each tenant with a bill that reflects what, you know, what your bill would actually look like when you start being billed under that submeter billing method. But you're not responsible to pay that bill during these three months, right? It's supposed to be um, giving you an example of what, number one, what those bills are going to look like, what charges are going to be included on those bills, and what your usage is going to look like. This is a really important time to inform your landlord of any leaks or meter issues. Um, again, this is the time where your landlord does have an affirmative duty to be testing for leaks and testing for um, accuracy during these three months. After that time, there's no affirmative duty to test for those, um, to test for issues with the submeter, but your landlord does have the duty to, um, to maintain them should there be an issue. So again, when you see issues, if there's an issue with your submeter, if there's an issue with um, you know, any kind of issue where you believe that a repair is needed, you do have to submit a written request, written repair request 
to your landlord. Um, that basically just says, hi, landlord. My name is tenant in space blank. And I have noticed that X is broken or Y needs to be repaired. Um, please take this as my reasonable accommodation or my reasonable repair request, right? And then sign your name and send that to your landlord. Um, I It needs to be in writing. So either a letter mailed to your landlord space, an email, a text, um, that's fine, but it has does need to be in writing. Um, so now the second point here <laughs> applies only if you're converting to submeter billing from rent included billing. And again, this is the whole reduction of rent. Um, so and it, and it makes sense, right? Because prior to this conversion, you were paying for your utilities, a portion of your rent was paying for utilities. So it doesn't make sense that you should still be paying the same rent amount and in addition to paying for utilities on top of that, right? That's a windfall for the landlord. Um, and so that's why this part of the law is included when you're converting from rent included, either to pro rata or to submeter billing. Um, so, you know, what we discussed on the last side does apply. So if they lower the amount of their next rent increase, um, then they can, they can get out of that rent, uh, they can get out of the rent reduction. Or if they decide that at the same time that they convert, so at the same time that they're converting the water billing for the individual space to a submeter, they can convert to pro rata billing for common areas. Again, this is only from rent included billing to submeter billing. So if you had previously rent included billing, your landlord can at the same time that they issue you that notice and hold the meeting with you to discuss the change in utility billing method, they would include in that notice that they will are also converting billing for common areas from rent included billing to pro rata billing. So if they choose not to do that, right? If they just change your water billing um, for your individual space from rent included to submeter, then they are allowed to offset that rent reduction basically to an amount equal to tenants pro rata share of 20% of the park's total bill. Um, so the law just basically says, we think that common areas equal 20% of a utility bill. So that's that's what that number is. But so essentially the way that you would find out what this amount is, is you would take the, the full bill charged to the landlord, uh, take 20% of that, take this, and then divide that uh, pro rata between all of the tenants. And that would become your common area billing share. Um, if, like I said, if your landlord does not choose to convert that pro rata billing for the common areas and keeps the common areas at rent included billing, they can offset the rent reduction by that amount, right? So by the 20% divided up by all of the tenants. So it would be, generally speaking, we're talking about um, the amount of occupied spaces. So if you know 20% is $20, you have 20 spaces, uh, your each space would be paying a dollar, right? So that that's kind of how that would look. Um, so again, if they don't have each space pay that dollar, pay that you know pay that pro rata share, then they can use that amount that the tenant would be paying had they done had they converted the the billing for common areas. They can use that amount amount and um, offset their required rent reduction by that amount, right? So again, you're going to use that same method here um, to determine how much rent needs to be reduced. And then you would use this method here. You would subtract this amount from the, the prior amount, and that would be the amount that your rent needs to be reduced. Again, this is confusing. I don't, <laughs> I know that. <laughs> so I don't expect anyone to take, take this away and be able to to do all of this math and understand all of this, um, what I'm really hoping is that 
you'll have the tools to um, kind of, you know, your ears will perk up or you'll, a red flag will kind of pop up where when you're, you're saying, okay, well, I know I was at rent included billing and we're converting to something else. And my, my landlord hasn't said anything to me about a rent reduction. That should be a red flag, right? Because they do have to explain to you the offset, right? They can't just do it all behind the scenes, right? And so that's, that's really what I'm hoping to achieve today is to get into your guys' minds enough um, what some of the requirements are, not all of the details of those requirements, but that that requirement exists. And then when you're seeing that your landlord isn't doing that thing, that that can be a trigger for you to reach out to your local legal aid office, to MMCRC, right? Um, to, to have somebody else take a look at what's going on because they're probably doing something wrong, right? And so that's the goal, right? Is that we can just get get enough information into your heads that um, when an, when a situation like this occurs, that you um, you have that wherewithal and enough information about your rights to know if something is being violated. Not enough to know how to file a complaint by yourself. We're not. No one's expecting you guys to go up there and sue your landlords all on your own. Definitely not expecting that. Um, what we are hoping to achieve is that you guys will be able to identify when something's going on um, early enough that you can contact a, a, an attorney and that we can do something about it before either the statute of limitations runs out or, um, or you know, something else occurs, right? All right. So... One of the other processes or legal requirements under the law for conversion to submeter billing, and this is true for conversion from rent included or from pro rata. So anytime you're converting to submeter billing, your landlord is allowed to recover the cost of installing those submeters from you guys, the tenants. So that cost includes the installation costs, it also includes any repairs um, or improvements that were necessary to the infrastructure of the utility system um, in order to install the submeters, right? So it can't just be like, oh, we want to replace these pipes, right? No, it has to be, you can't install the submeter on that space with that size of pipe because it's not compatible with the submeter. So it requires you to make a repair or an improvement to the system because the um, the submeters won't work with the system without those repairs or improvements. Um, it can only be actual costs to the landlord. So the landlord can't you know, just add random things. The landlord's not allowed to uh, you know, benefit financially from this. They're just supposed to be able to recover the costs. Um, the landlord must provide each tenant with a copy of that payment plan, um, and that has to occur 90 days before the first payment is due. Your landlord cannot start charging these payments before the installation of the submeters is complete, and your landlord cannot, um, cannot char start charging you these payments more than six months after installation. So essentially, your landlord has a period of six months um, right after installation to six months after installation to provide you with that 90 day notice and begin collecting the, these payments from you. If your landlord fails to provide that notice um, or provide fails to provide the notice and start the payments within those six months, then they're not allowed to recoup the, these costs, right? So that's their deadline for providing the notice and beginning the payments. Um, so the amount, the frequency, and the length of these payments. Um, so again, it's a pro rata method of apportioning the landlord's costs. So you're going to take all of the costs that um, to install the submeters, the, the submeters themselves, the labor, any of the repairs that were necessary, right? Put that all into a big pot. And then we're going to go ahead and break that pot up by number of occupied spaces or by number of occupants in the park. And that's going to give you, you know, your pro rata amount. That's what you're going to be paying at least or no more frequently than every month. And it has to be over a period of at least 60 months, right? So if you take the full cost, 
um, say it's $10,000 and you have 10 tenants, each tenant would be ultimately responsible for that $1,000, but you would split that $1,000 up over, so you would divide 1,000 by 60, right? Because, and then that would give you your monthly payment. Um, generally, I've seen these payments be anywhere between like $4.95 $4 to like $17 a month. So it really kind of depends, um, you know, on how much, how many improvements or repairs were needed to your utility system, uh, how many submeters there were, right? Like, so the, the cost really does, does differ depending on the park um, and depending on what their existing, you know, existing utility infrastructure looked like. Because, you know, as we know, some of these parks are pretty old and the, that utility infrastructure is also very outdated. Um, and so that, you know, that switched to pro rata bill, or excuse me, that switch to submeter billing does require an updating of the system. And so this is something that uh, again, reflects that intention um, to conserve water and um, to, to incentivize landlords to switch to submeter billing. Um, that's why this exists, right? If landlords had to pay for the cost of the submeters completely out of pocket and we're not able to recoup this cost, we likely would not see submeters in parks. Um, it's expensive. And of course, landlords are in the business of making money. And if um, so that's why the legislature included this is to incentivize um, that switch to submeters. And, um, you know, having talked to some of the people who actually drafted these laws, um, it, you know, tenants actually were in favor of of creating systems where we can switch over to submeter because, again, they felt that um, you know their usage was not really being reflected in their bill and that they were conserving lots of water, but their bill was um, just as high as people who were not conserving water. And so, um, you know, many tenants were very excited about having submeters because they were then able to have more control over the cost of their utilities, right? Um, again, unfortunately, this is just one of those, those compromises that was had to be made in the law where um, in order to, to make conversion to submeter billing more likely, um, there had to be a mechanism for landlords to recover those costs. Um, I do think that because it's over of a period of at least 60 months, um, that that you know, that does provide, you know, that makes it a little bit more feasible for tenants to be able to pay, pay that amount. Um, like I said, it's generally um, less than $20 a month. I've not seen one be more than $20 a month. Um, these payments must be itemized separately on your utility bill. Again, like we talked about, each different type of utility needs to be listed differently on that bill. Um, and there was one more thing I wanted to say about this. Can't remember. Yeah, I mean, I think that basically, um, apologies. <laughs> All right, there we go. Um, so yeah, that's basically the the gist of it. Um, again, this does impact tenants financially, um, but but landlords do have to uh, you know follow the follow the procedure and provide that notice at least ninety days before the first payment is due. Um, and and yeah, so um, it is an unfortunate part of the law, and tenants are not always excited about about this part, um, but I do think that it's really important that tenants know that this part of the law exists um, because oftentimes, you know, tenants are excited about switching to submeter billing until they go to that meeting and uh, learn about this recovery statute. So it's important to know if you are wanting submeter billing in your park, it is very, very likely that you're going to be paying um, a special assessment fee every month after the installation of those submeters to uh, pay your landlord back for the cost of installing them. Um, also important to note that 
the, the payment plan attaches to the rented space and not the tenant. So if the tenant moves out, so say you sell your home, um, you know, 10 months into this agreement, you sell your home and someone else moves in. Well, you're not going to have to pay this special assessment once you don't live in the park for the next 50 months, right? No, that's crazy. The the payment plan will attach to your space and the person who purchased your home and became a tenant in the park will now have to pay that special assessment for the next 50 months, right? And again, if they sell within those 50 months, the new tenant who takes over will take over that payment plan. Um, and payments, um, you know, once the payment plan has been, you know, once the full amount has been paid, then payments have to stop, right? It doesn't attach forever. It just attaches until that entire amount is paid. Um, so the other way that your landlord may unilaterally change um, your utility billing is in the garbage billing method. They may convert to direct billing, and this is from rent included or pro rata billing. Um, this is only applies if the service provider supplies garbage receptacles to tenants, collects and disposes of that garbage, and either bills the tenant directly or bills um, the landlord who then bills the tenant based on the number and size of the receptacles used. So this is um, how, you know, um, how most garbage service works where you'll receive um, either a large garbage can, a small garbage can, a medium sized garbage can, um, and that garbage is collected weekly. And depending on the size of your garbage, you're going to be charged differently, right? you have the biggest garbage can, you're going to be charged the most. Um, so, so that's, you know, that's how we're basing the cost of it, right? Um, if the landlord wants to do this, they have to provide tenant at least 180 days written notice. So, you know, they can't just one day decide to convert their garbage billing, right? Um, they, you know, if they do change their service provider or change, um, you know, from having big garbage, like garbage canister type situations versus having individual ones, if your landlord is doing that based on the service provider, that's fine, but they can't change the way that they bill you for it unless this applies, unless they provided that 180 days written notice and the service provider meets those requirements. Um, it's also important to note that the landlord can't convert the garbage method less than a year after giving notice of a rent increase. So, um, so you know, if you just received a rent increase, a lot of people receive them in September to take place, to take effect in uh, January. So if you've received that, right, and, th and that's your situation, your landlord cannot, um, cannot change your garbage method, you know, without your consent um, until probably the following, it would be like October, right? And so until after that notice had, a year after they have issued that notice. Um, if you're converting from rent included billing, so again, this applies to both pro rata and rent included billing conversions to direct billing. Um, if you're coming from rent included billing, then the landlord does have that duty to reduce your rent by amount comparable to the previous amount that they would spend um, on those that utility, previous amount of your rent that they would spend on that utility. Um, this is the same principle that we've discussed in previous slides. Um, that you know the way that they figure out that amount is they look at the past year of bills um, and and how much money, you know, how much those bills cost, how many people are on rent included billing, and then figure out the share of the of the rent that was going to those utilities. Again, it's not the most simple math, so um, don't feel bad if you're confused. This is the type of stuff that the attorney would be handling. Um, the, the part that you really need to have a grasp on is that if I'm being converted from rent included billing to pro rata to submeter or to direct billing, then my landlord is going to have to reduce my rent um, or you know have some kind of an offset that allows them to not reduce my rent. But there's going to have to be a conversation about that rent reduction or a notice about the rent reduction. 
if that doesn't occur, that's your trigger, right? Another way that your landlord may convert your bill, the utility billing method for water is by holding a park-wide vote. So this requires tenant consent. Um, so it's not a unilateral change. Your landlord does have to get the consent of a majority of tenants. Um, your landlord has to hold a park-wide vote. Um, and in that park-wide vote, each space is allowed to cast only one vote. Um, the, the ballot must contain an opportunity to vote against any change. Um, and the ballot can contain two new methods. So if you're on pro, say you're on rent included billing and your landlord gives you a ballot that says, do you want to change to pro rata billing? Do you want to change to sub meter billing? They also have to uh, include a third option that says, do you want to keep your current billing, right? So, so no matter what, if the ballot has more than one choice for conversion, um, there has to be that option to vote against both of the options, right? So they, they have to have an option on this ballot to say, I want to keep our existing billing method. Um, notice is required, again, so at least one month prior to the vote, landlord must uh, deliver a notice. Same kind of thing that we talked about previously for those requirements to change the water, right? A notice that requires their intention to change the method, the new proposed method, the reason for the conversion, and the process and schedule for the conversion, including the date, time, and location of the meeting that's required. Um, and again, at least one month prior to the vote, the landlord must hold a meeting with tenants, distribute a mock-up bill, um, and an explanation for each entry. If the landlord is, attempt is going to contain two options of conversion, so two different methods of conversion on their ballot, at that meeting, they need to, th that mock bill does need to um, reflect both of those options, right? So if there's a, a pro rata option and then there's a sub meter option, um, you would have to provide a mock up bill for both of those options, right? Because otherwise tenants can't make an informed decision about what they'd like to do if they're only receiving a mock-up of one of the options. Um, another instance where your landlord can um, add charges, add utility charges is for, excuse me, yawn, <laughs> sorry, um, is for cable television, direct satellite, video subscription services, or internet access. Um, oh my Whenever I click on it. <laughs> ah, I'm so sorry. There we go. Um, this is only true if that additional amount is not more than 10% of the tenant's utility bill. So basically that means if you're looking at your prior utility bill, you'd add up all of those utility costs, um, the utility charges on that bill, and this additional amount can't be more than 10% of that total bill cost, right? So if you're paying water, electric, garbage, and common areas, right? Then you would add those things up. That's your total bill. This cost can't be more than 10% of that bill. Um, also, that the total utility charge and the additional amount is less than the typical cost the tenant would incur if they received the service directly. This just means like, if this you can't be charging, um, you know, if 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 under your utility billing methods, the tenant is paying way more than they would be paying if they just signed up for Netflix themselves, if they just had internet themselves, if they, you know, just did these things you know, themselves directly with the service provider. Um, if if what the landlord is doing is charging them more than that for these same services, then that's not going to work, right? So the, the point is, is that if the landlord is providing some kind of, you know, cable, satellite, video subscription, or internet, is that it's, um, it actually benefits the tenants of the park, right, by sharing those services. So it shouldn't, if you get your own internet from Comcast, that should not, that should cost more than sharing internet with your park, right? So if it doesn't, if 
if sharing the internet with your park somehow is more than doing it yourself, then you we've got a problem here and <laughs> for sure. Um, the written rental agreement has to describe these charges or this additional amount, and that has to be separately from other utility or service charges. Um, so again, you know, your written rental agreement is going to have everything about your utility billing in it. It has to be stated there in your written rental agreement. The, the things that we have talked about previously, other than the voting method, are ways that your landlord can amend that rental agreement regarding utilities by themselves. Um, other than those specific things that we talked about, your landlord is not allowed to change the method of utility billing in your rental agreement without your consent, right? So um, as it says here, if your landlord wants to amend the rental agreement to include this additional fee, you don't have to agree. Your landlord does not have a right to do this by themselves. It requires mutual agreement, right? Um, if your landlord is offering this and you say, no, thank you, um, your landlord cannot terminate your rental agreement. So if your landlord um, if, if your landlord says, I'm going to do this, I'm going to add internet, this is how much it's going to cost you. And you say, uh, no, I'm good. I don't want that. And then your landlord provides you with a notice of termination for cause, give a legal aid lawyer a call because that's definitely not allowed. They cannot force you um, to amend your rental agreement regarding utilities other than those specific instances that we've already talked about. And I'd like to note that there is not a duty to provide internet um, or cable or satellite. Um, your landlord just does not have a duty to provide those things. However, if they do provide them at the beginning of your rental agreement, then they need to be providing those um, adequately, right? Um, so can your landlord make you pay for common area utilities? Yes, they can, but only if it is stated clearly in your written rental agreement. Um, so essentially in the section on utility billing, it would need to say, you know, have like a section for common areas and explain that you will be charged for a pro rata um, share of the common area utilities and explain what, you know, how that pro rata apportionment is gonna work. Is that by rented space? Is that by occupant? Right, so they, that needs to be explained in your rental agreement. Um, any common area utility charge needs to be separately itemized on your bill. So, you know, your water charge is X amount, common area utility charge X amount, right? It needs to be separately stated on that, that bill. Um, your landlord cannot unilaterally amend this part of your rental agreement. So your landlord cannot force you to agree to pay for common area utilities um, once you've already signed a rental agreement. So long as that's not in your current rental agreement, they cannot make you agree to pay for those common area utilities um, by themselves, right? You can agree to it yourself. I don't know why you would do that, probably don't, but, um, but, but yeah, so your landlord cannot force you, can't evict you for failing to agree to it. Um, the one exception is that if your landlord is converting from rent included billing, only rent included billing, to sub meter billing for water, at that same time, they are allowed to convert the common area water bill from rent included to pro rata billing. Um, we talked about this a little bit before, but basically, your landlord's going to have to follow all of those notice requirements providing the bill requirements, all of that um, for both the transition for your space to submeter billing from rent included and for common area billing, right? So the notice would have to say, it's my intention to convert your water billing from rent included to submeter billing for your rented space and to convert common area utility billing from rent included to pro rata. And this is the pro rata apportionment method that we'll use, right? So that has to be set forth and explained very clearly in the landlord's notice and their sample bills that occur at that beginning stages of the conversion, right? That, that are required to happen one month before the conversion occurs. 
if your landlord does not include um, this language, does not include their intention to convert the common area water billing from rent included to pro rata in those initial meetings, in that in the initial notice and initial meeting, then they are foreclosed um, from doing so, right? They, they have one legal method for unilaterally converting that common area utility billing, and it is only if they do it at the same time and meet the requirements um, as they're converting from rent included billing for water to submeter billing for water. So again, there's a lot of extra rules here when we're talking about rent included, rent conversion from rent included billing. And I think that if we think about it logically, it does make sense, right? Because a portion of your rent was previously used to pay for those utilities. So continuing to pay that full amount plus utilities is a windfall to landlord. So we're going to be have to talk about rent reductions and rent offsets under rent included billing conversions. And also you're going to have, um, you have the impact of a conversion for the common areas when you're converting from rent included to submeter billing. Again, this is the only time that your landlord can require you to start paying for common area utilities. Unless that's stated in your rental agreement, your landlord cannot require you to pay for those common area utilities. Um, and they, you know, they can't require you to sign a new agreement. They can't, uh, you know, they can't do that, right? So once, once you've got a month-to-month -month rental agreement with the park, that continues to go on uh, throughout time, right? And they can't require unilateral changes. So they can't say, accept this change or you're evicted. Um, they just can't, can't do that except for under very certain circumstances with certain processes and procedures like we saw previously. <clears throat> Um, again, can my landlord evict me for failure to pay a utility or service charge? Uh, we talked about this briefly at the beginning of this presentation, but yes, they can. Um, failure to pay a utility or service charge is grounds for termination for cause under 90.630. Um, the landlord must serve a 30-day written termination notice. The notice must give you 30 days to pay the utility charge and avoid termination. That's what we call cure. Um, the notice must also include a handout from the judicial department regarding rent and legal assistance. Um, and if the termination notice expires and your landlord files an eviction case with the courts, the law does give you a right to pay that past due amount and avoid eviction up until trial. Um, we talked about this a little bit previously. Um, you can't pay it during trial. You can't pay at the end of trial when you realize you've lost. You got to pay it before that trial starts. Um, it, uh, failure to pay a utility or serv service charge, again, is not grounds for termination of non-payment of rent under 90.394, um, only termination for cause, right? Because uh, utility and service charges are not rent. So what happens if your landlord violates these rules? Well, then you've got a legal claim. So the, the damages that are included in this little chunk of statutes is um, tenant can recover the greater of one month's rent or twice, act, twice the actual damages, including any amount wrongfully charged. These claims don't accrue for each instance of the landlord's violation. So let's say that a tenant was wrongfully charged or you know there was a violation that occurred every single month for a year that tenant is only entitled to either one month's rent or twice the actual damages. The fact that that violation occurred every month for 12 months does not entitle the tenant to 12 months of rent and damages, right? It's not, um, each claim, you know, the, the violation of this, these statutes provides you with the one claim. So even if you can prove multiple violations, um, you know, if you're suing those multiple violations in one claim, you've got damages for one month's rent. Um, this is, this just came out of the, gosh, 
Court of Appeals or Supreme Court? I can't remember which one, uh, which court was it that decided, but uh, we did just get um, a decision that basically states this principle that the statute's very clear. You get the greater of one month's rent or twice the actual damages and the amount of, um, you know, the, the recurrence of that violation doesn't entitle the tenant to um, additional damages. So we just got that case Oh, I want to say a couple months ago. It's an unfortunate decision, but um, there you have it. Um, again, something to, to note here is that the Oregon Residential Landlord Tenant Act um, is civil law, right? So there's not in, there's no enforcement agency or oversight agency for landlords. Um, you know, there aren't, there's no police for landlords. There's no one that's going to you know, go find them or give them a violation notice. That's just not what, that that doesn't occur in civil law, right? Civil law is enforced by civilians. <laughs> um, so basically you would need to enforce your rights through the courts by filing either a civil case or a small claims case against your landlord. Um, I highly suggest that you don't do that on your own. Um, I always suggest that if you think you have a claim against your landlord, um, that you should reach out to an attorney. As I mentioned, there are um, legal aid offices, either Legal Aid Services of Oregon or the Oregon Law Center um, that serve every single county in the state of Oregon. If you go to www.oregonlawhelp.org, um, there is an interactive map on that site that will help you find your um, the right legal aid office for you. Um, there's also a modest means attorney referral program with the Oregon State Bar. Um, that program will allow you to request a referral for a specific issue, and your uh, and you know attorneys throughout the state have signed up to this program, and they agree that they'll hold an initial consultation with those referrals um, for thirty dollars. After that initial consultation, the fees are set by that attorney. So while your initial con consultation is definitely affordable under that modest needs program, it does not guarantee you affordable representation throughout the life of that case. Um, after that initial $30 consultation, the, the private attorney will be setting their own prices and working with you for um, working with you on a, a, a pay plan. Um, not all the time do we need to go to court to get damages or resolve claims. Um, oftentimes these, more often than not, claims are settled outside of court. Um, there is, you know, mediation is available um, for facility tenants. Um, negotiation is always available as well. Um, often negotiation does work better when you've got an attorney um, involved and um and yeah so you know i mean if you think that you've got a a claim against your landlord and you're interested in um, resolving that claim but you're maybe not so excited about the thought of going to court you can still reach out to an attorney um, and discuss your options like i said more often than not these types of cases resolve outside of court and don't require a lawsuit um the reason for that is that under the Oregon Landlord Tenant Act, there's something called fee shifting, which means whoever wins the case can make the loser pay their attorney's fees. Um, so it can get really expensive to go to court. And so if a landlord knows <clears throat> that you are planning to sue them and um, you know you give them, either you give them a copy of your complaint or a demand letter that explains your position um, and, and your claim, right? So how much how many da what what damages you would like or what resolution you would like um and your landlord sees that and sees that that's a valid claim um a good claim that's likely to win in court they have a, a high incentive to settle that issue with you outside of court um because once once you're in that courtroom um and you know even if you retain a legal aid attorney or someone from Oregon Law Center like me where we don't charge our tenants we will charge your landlord. So if you know if there's a case, file it with the courts and we win and you've got a legal aid attorney, even though we would not 
provide our tenants, you know, our clients with a bill, we will, if we win in court, provide your landlord with a bill for our attorney's fees. Um, and landlords know that. So, so there is an incentive for landlords to try and resolve these things without going to court um, because, you know, there's that risk that they'll lose and that they will have to pay attorney's fees, which can be in the thousands of dollars, which is often much more than the damages that we're looking at here, which is one month's rent. Usually that's going to be less than a thousand dollars in a park. So, um, so if you just think about it logically, the landlord has an incentive to just go ahead and pay out the damages prior to getting sued because, um, you know, the cost and benefit, it's just really not there. Not only would they have to pay my attorney's fees, but if they hired an attorney, they would also have to pay their fees as well. So it can get very expensive. All right, so that's really the end of the presentation. Uh, again, these utility bill statutes are long and a bit complicated and have a lot of different caveats depending on your existing billing method, the proposed billing method, whether your landlord wants to do it with your approval or without your approval, right? So there are, there's a lot of different processes and procedures depending on the specific circumstances. Um, and so I highly suggest that if you feel like something's going amiss in a utility bill, bill conversion case, um, please reach out to, to legal aid um, or the Oregon State Bar and, um, and have an attorney take a peek at that case because like I said, Oftentimes, you know, your landlord isn't even using the right statute. So <laughs> sometimes it just takes, uh, you know, it takes some investigation and really looking um, and and uh, researching in the law as well to figure out exactly where your circumstance fits and what those requirements are for them. And I know we don't have a whole lot of people in the meeting right now, but if anyone is here, that's here and would like to ask a question, I'm happy to do that. Not really. Um, that means I either confused you a lot or I was thorough. <laughs> no, I think you're pretty thorough. And uh, I was curious, uh, the, uh, fact sheet that we had does that kind of comport hey, Judy, do you with... want to go ahead and un, uh, stop recording yeah no the 